Well, welcome everybody. Is it working? I guess I got to get it a little. Yeah, there we go. I hear it. Okay, so uh, a few announcements be before we get started with uh, the main event. Um, next month here, we're having a woman talk about the health effects of fossil fuel extractions. And uh, her name is Nancy Jacobson. She teaches at Ithaca College. So that'll be the, I don't remember the date, the third, uh, May 21st. Thank you, Bob. Because well, I remember in 2013, last time it fell on a Tuesday, we had a meeting and it was hot and humid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, then we have a few other things coming up. Um, and we're going to hear about what our student group is cooking up. Uh, I won't get into that yet. But there's a big event they're going to talk about. Um, also, on April 27th, we have some singers, music satire and social commentary, Tom Nielsen and Lynn Waldron. Uh, th that'll be Saturday, April 27th, 7 p.m. at the Binghamton University Lecture Hall 14. There's a lot of these flyers at the table. If if you could take some flyers, if you know places that you could post them, that would help. We're going to try to plaster them on campus, too. Um, and then the day after that is the Earth Fest at SUNY Broome. Um, we will have a presence there at a table. Uh, if, if you want to be involved, see me. I think we probably can use another person or two to sit at the table. Um, but some of you may be there for other uh, reasons or other organizations too. But if you just want to go, if you've never, ever been to Earth Fest, it's a great way to meet a lot of groups and see what they're doing in the local area. Um, are there any other announcements? Chris? Yeah, um, we have a Vines Build Day that we're collaborating with on the 5th of May, so it'll be a Cinco de Mayo celebration. Um, there are two time slots if anybody wants to volunteer. They're, we're building um, a fence at their Vestal Garden location. It's a new location. It's 12 to 3.30 or 4 to 6 on May 5th. Um, more details to come. There won't be too many more details. But. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, introductions, why we are here, the four R's, uh, what the climate crisis is, and then the divestment effort that this group has got going at uh, un the university and then um, the Anthony Brindisi Town Hall which I wasn't going to tell you about they'll tell you about it so that's roughly our agenda um, but there's a lot of other pieces in that and um, also Baldy if you could start this off we're going to ask you to fill out uh, your name if you if you could on the sign-in sheet. Is everybody here on our list serve? Um, anybody not that wants to be? Okay. So other, we don't need your email address then. Um, so um, what I would like to do then is kind of kick things off here. Uh, it is a privilege to have these young people meeting us with us older people and they are inspiring. Uh, they have already accomplished some pretty interesting things. One of them, they, they held a week-long series of uh, teach-ins, or they call it a workshop, which got very involved. Um, and we want to give you just a little sense of that tonight, but the outcome of that is this divestment effort. One of the outcomes, and the other outcome is... Uh, getting Anthony Brindisi to come to campus. But, uh, and uh, what they stated and what I put out in the listserv email about this meeting was that uh, we are the first generation that will feel the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can do anything about it. This crisis is not of our making, but it must be of our unmaking. This unmaking begins with untelling. We must tirelessly challenge all the stories that have driven us into the, this crisis. 
So we, as older adults, won't see everything that they will see most likely as far as the impacts that climate change will bring. Um, the future looks rather grim unless there's tremendous resolve and action that w we can uh, help each other uh, achieve. It has to be, of course, a global effort. Otherwise, um, by 2040, possibly by 2050, you will see major devastation affecting humans and animals and our planet. I won't belabor that much more, but we'll f hear more about it. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand the mic over to Georgia Kirkezes, and then and then we'll have the students. Well, maybe I should start with you. We'll, we'll go this way. We'll start with, yeah, we'll start with George here. We'll go down the line. You guys introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, my name is George. I'm from Brooklyn, uh, New York. My grandma's from Bermuda. <laughs> Hi, my name is Liat. I'm from New Jersey. My name is Georgia. Um, I'm from Rochester. My name is Isabel. I'm from New York City. And my name is Seth. I'm from an hour south of Rochester, Finger Lakes region of New York. Oh, <laughs> All right. Can you guys hear me OK? OK. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of the history of our group and how we came together and created um, our group. So um, it started with an internship, which I am the president of at Binghamton University. It's called Binghamton University Food Sustainability. Um, and when I was the president last semester, George was an intern. And he um, decided to do a project which uh, culminated in the workshops, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, about the climate crisis after the UN's report on the climate crisis, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of. Um, you know, by 2030, the year 2030, we might be seeing drastic crises happening within the environment and then within society. So that really kicked uh, George to make some workshops about that. Um, and so in making those workshops, he kind of brought us all together in a very weird and beautiful way. Um, we all didn't really know each other before then, um, but we we know each other very well now, so we helped roll those climate crisis workshops out. Um, and yeah, so we did five different ones for a week. We did them twice a day. And I think we managed to get around 100 students to come in total. So that was really cool, you know, bring students together to learn about what the climate crisis even is, to learn about climate change. Some people didn't really even know what it was, if, it, if it's not something that they really study every day. Um, and that was cool. And then... After we did that week of the climate workshops, we did one more workshop, which we called Student Power. And so that was really how we took this new knowledge and passion and translated it into action, um, which we thought was really important because we can talk and talk and talk about climate change and what we should do about it, um, but we're gonna try and actually do something about it now. So um, like we mentioned earlier that um, is culminating in the divestment campaign, which we're starting on campus, um, and then having Anthony Brindisi come to campus also um, and talk with us. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the workshops we did and the perspective we took on them. And Seth, can you pass this to Vera? And Vera, this is a list of the workshops. Vera, if you could just pass it around, people could read the descriptions. So the, the first workshop we did on um, the Monday of that week uh, was kind of an introduction to people who weren't environmental studies majors and may not uh, have a uh, understanding of not only the climate crisis but the context for the climate crisis. Um, so that workshop was looking at the big picture of these converging issues uh, and trying to ask what kind of new words, what kind of new language and new metaphors do we need to un uh, do we need to uh, find to be able to make the right action. And the four themes uh, that we established in that first workshop, and they're up on the board, I guess, uh, were resistance, uh, resilience, relinquishment, and and re uh, and restoration. So, uh, resistance asks, what do we need to stop, uh, and how do we, uh, and how do we stop those things? Um, like, what are the political, economic, social, and technological systems that we need to dismantle? Um, Resilience asks, what do we want to keep? Uh, like, and how do we maintain the 
things we most value in a climate unstable and resource potentially resource scarce future um, relinquishment asks what what do we have to let go what won't be possible in the future and what is preventing the changes that need to happen from happening and uh, restoration asks what do we need to recover and and that and all these have ecological things there's we need to have ecological restoration we also need to have social restoration community restoration and personal restoration and the rest of the workshops kind of went into uh, kind of were applying those themes from different angles so the second workshop looked at pattern the patterns of economic development that got us here right so we looked at the history of broom uh, broom county from a environmental justice perspective starting with colonization moving through industrialization and into the present and kind of imagining how we can break those patterns and find al al and go into alternative directions for the future uh, I think the next workshop was the next workshop the ecofeminism one no next so the next the next workshop was uh, uh, about patterns of technological development um, that have brought us into this crisis and asking how we can break those patterns uh, into the future, uh, going into the future. The, the uh, sec next one was about uh, pa uh, patterns of cultural development. It was, a, how, it was about understanding how the way we talk about climate change implicitly often reinforces certain maybe patriarchal understandings of nature. So we talk about climate change as this thing we need to fight, we need to combat. Uh, and that language itself uh, suggests, uh, em oh, emphasizes certain types of actions and underemphasizes other kinds of actions. And that workshop, we were trying to reframe it as uh, we need to like heal this wound almost. And then if we have that metaphor, if we change the metaphor to healing and not fighting, then what are the response? How does the response change? And then the last workshop we did. Uh, was about patterns of agricultural development and we looked at a big we, and we looked at in that workshop we kind of tried to break uh, the very true but also uh, limiting dichotomy between organic and industrial agriculture and looked at a longer history of American agriculture and a longer history of agriculture across the whole world to see um, as like Wes Jackson says uh, how can we solve the problems in agriculture by solving the problems of agriculture and um, unfortunately, there's no ideal past we can go to in American agriculture. The whole history has been eroding soils. That's the whole history of westward expansion. So in this workshop, we tried to find, we tried to outline kind of a paradigm shift uh, towards regenerative agriculture. And that was probably the most hopeful workshop. I think we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. We, we talk about that a lot in our student letter because Anthony Brindisi is on the, the student letter we're gonna be delivering to him next week at the event we'll talk about later. Because Anthony Rendizzi is on the uh, committee, the uh, House Committee of Agriculture, and uh, regenerative agriculture has a lot of potential for storing carbon, restoring biodiversity, filtering water, restoring aquifers, uh, and promoting resiliency. So th those are the four workshops. I think I'm going to pass it to Liat. Is that right? <laughs> we have a little system. Um, so my take on this whole climate crisis situation, I was never an environmental major. I was only exposed to based on what I saw and my, exper my, exper my experience was. Um, and so I'm a human development major. And basically what I've been seeing is people just don't feel right. Like nothing feels right. And I think that um, when you look at, you know, people are living a sedentary lifestyle and then they'll go to the gym for an hour and have a burst of energy or they'll, um, you know, I work at a summer camp and just all these kids are just so high strung and they don't really know where to put this energy. And I think that a lot of this connects to how we are interacting with the environment. How do we, um, how do we perceive the environment? And I think that um, th these emotions surrounding the environment are in effect changing because of climate change um, and when I started to think about what is my role in this climate crisis 
um, I felt that my my right as a as a w person who identifies as a woman that my choice to have a child is actually compromised and I feel that like and I didn't know that this feeling was mutual when I was speaking with other people in this group that our generation has these anxieties and these you know depressive thoughts that we we can't live the life that we were promised by previous generations because of this crisis and I think that we are here to come together and say that no we can live this life we, if we take these strides and this radical change to ensure that I can have a, an earth and a, and a planet that I can have pride in my children because right now I feel like I don't have pride and I know that a lot of us share that similar feeling and um, I think it is possible to make our environment in, um, habitable and desirable and I think that you know we when my dad always says that when he was a kid that they would um, he would just go to the playground and he would go to the park and all his friends would be there and that's not the case today if I went to the park there would be nobody um, the, the, pe the people that I if I wanted to find my friends it would be online or it would be behind a screen and um, I think that because we've removed ourselves from water systems from food systems you know like even in the dining halls I have no idea where my food is coming out coming from we've just removed ourselves completely from all these systems um, we're just you know, just being guided and misguided in a way, and we have no idea. We're just this communal imagination in a sense. So, um, you know, I think that that's where the emotion plays in. Like, how does climate change affect how we are developing children and how um, these children in our next generation are going to grow up, and will it affect their development? I, I think one thing, one sentence. I think one thing Layad is really saying is, a lot of people our age feel, if there are people who are worried about these issues, feels like everything's connected and we're not going to be able to solve climate change without solving uh, all the other social and personal and cultural crises that we face. Uh, yeah, so just to give my personal take on it, like um, Liat was saying, I don't know how I can beat that, um, but personally, uh, through my perspective, um, I tend, I try to understand this environmental crisis through our relationships with the outdoors. Um, so I, I personally love to recreate all the time. Um, I'm president of the Outdoors Club. Um, and so uh, I found a statistic a year ago that said that uh, the average American citizen spends 95% of, of their life inside. Um, and so we talk about this, uh, this larger system contributing to climate change and like that is the primary cause of climate change um and i think that uh that pro that system that is causing climate change is also uh directly in like is causing the disconnect that we have with the uh with the outdoors um so it's kind of this it, it it's this whole circle um of just absolute disconnection and it is quite frightening to see how just utterly disconnected and utterly uh, out of touch we are and um, how we've completely accelerated this problem simply because we're just not in tune with what's happening around us. Um, so, yeah. Do you have anything else, <laughs> have anything else to say about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. going back to the themes and going back to what you were saying about uh, untelling stories that's a big that's a big story the story of separation uh uh that's a big experience right i mean that's a big like there's no person who lives off the land that doesn't know climate change is happening isn't freaking out like there's no farmer who isn't like damn this weather's weird <laughs> like the fact that we have to read about these things in the newspaper to fr to be worried about them like says that we're already too alienated to do anything about it and to make the real change. So it's not gonna happen until we get away from that separation. I wanna interject just one thing quick. So you've heard some young voices and uh, I myself have to acknowledge how addicted to fossil fuels I've been and all of us have been. Uh, w we didn't know better, but uh, now we, we do know what it's doing to our planet and what it's doing to future generations. So uh, I have to be honest and ask for apologies 
to future generations. Um, and we, we need to stay with them, you know, as they move into the future too. We're gonna have to do some role in this. Uh, it can't all be on them, but uh, so that's, that's one reason we're here tonight. And now you're gonna talk about, go ahead. Uh, okay, my name's Valdi Wiederpass. Um, basically, I'm gonna try to follow along with what the students have been saying and also to chime in with Scott. Uh, us old generation, baby boomer, boomers and even older, we have the bulk of the economic power and we have to do more than we're doing and we need to be more involved in politics become more active than we are as a group as well to push the system away from where it's being directed right now by big money. I'm, I'm going to stop on that because I've, I've got to cover something that is more important here locally because this is a talk on local uh, issues uh, as well and, and uh, basically what I want to talk about is how it affects uh, how climate change is affecting Broome County and the fact that you really can't escape climate change just because you live away from the ocean. It's happening even if you live on a hillside. And here we are, we're a long distance away from the ocean, a few hundred miles away, and we've had some horrendous events recently, which I'm gonna touch on a little bit. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail, but some of these facts that I dug up over the last few days were surprising even to me. Uh, Climate change has both severe uh, acute effects and also subtle effects. And severe ef effects, one of the biggest ones is floods. Uh, in 2006, we had a record-breaking flood and uh, it was higher than the 1972 historic floods that people in this area thought would be the highest that, and most damage causing than anybody would ever see. So 2006, it broke do those records it topped flood walls that were built after the 1972 Hurricane Agnes flood. And uh, not widespread, but in a few uh, locations, uh, downtown Binghamton, as well as uh, where I used to work in the old uh, GE plant, which was built uh, during World War II. It was an Air Force plant, Air Force Plant 59. Um, and luckily, the 2006 flood event uh, People at, that uh, worked at the, the factory were able to use sandbags to plug the small low areas uh, on the flood wall and uh, use pumps to keep uh, water from uh, ruining the plant and uh, da damage was avoided. However, in the community, 3,300 people were evacuated, 3,000 structures were damaged, and $175 million of property damage uh, occurred as a result of the flood. And of course that wasn't enough. So five years later, 2011, yet again, we had a record-breaking flood about one and a half feet higher than the 2006 flood. And uh, the 2006 flood uh, had half a foot of water over about two and a half days. 2011 flood was 10 inches in 24 hours in some areas and a total of about a foot uh, in just over 24 hours. Um, and um, so in this case, many uh, flood walls and levees were overtopped. And uh, behind the factory where I used to work, uh, there was no way to stop it. And it just came over and it ended up flooding the entire plant with 42 inches of water, which is high enough to get onto people's desks. So anything they had out uh, on the desk or if they had computers on their desk or on the floor, those were all ruined. A lot of the equipment in the, the factory was ruined, had to be disassembled, painstakingly taken apart, washed. We had subcontractors that we had to pay to do that. Uh, then we had to put them all back together, troubleshoot it, make sure it worked, then pack it up and store it. And that was a tremendous effort. It took months. Meanwhile, they were negotiating to find out where they could move this business. And this community was in danger of losing 1,200 or so jobs to someplace else that could have been moved. Luckily, it was relocated and saved in downtown Endicott here in the old IBM campus, which is now called the Huron campus. Um, but this was a tremendous effort. Uh, and uh, again, another personal aspect 
my own house, which I don't even live near the river. There was no river flooding at my house, but when I got home, uh, when I tr was trudging through uh, two inches of water on, on the pavement, that, because it was still raining cats and dogs outside, uh, walked down to the basement, uh, or not basement, but family room, which is the lower level, sort of like a basement, but it's a finished, finished off section. Groundwater had penetrated through cracks in the foundation. So the rug was soaked. So that was another thing that we had to try to deal with at home. We had to empty our family room of furniture, rescue all that stuff. And then what, at work, I had to go rescue stuff from within a, a muddy, dirty building. Um, so this affects people personally. And uh, then worse yet, 24,000 people had to be evacuated from their homes. 2,500 people were sheltered. And if you want to see what that looks like, here's the picture. This is like New Orleans from uh, the hurricane that they suffered through. This is like a smaller version of that in the Binghamton University arena. People in cots that couldn't go to their homes because they were inundated. So this is, I mean, I wasn't even aware of this. And I lived through this flood. Major damage to water and sewer systems, which are still being dealt with. 350 private wells were contaminated, 7,000 structures damaged, half a billion dollars of property damage. And that's just property damage that's reported. My own uh, damage in, in my family room, that's not part of the, the statistic and probably is true for hundreds of other homes as well. So the number, the real number is higher than half a billion dollars. And then the aftermath we're still living with. 370 homes uh, and properties were bought out and demolished, and that's now grass. Uh, there's a new MacArthur Elementary School that was built because that got flooded and ruined. Uh, there's ongoing uh, joint sewage treatment plant uh, reconstruction work going on. Uh, and another half a billion dollars were spent to try to improve flood control and uh, levees and, and uh, temporary gates and uh, one-way valves on culverts and things like that. Um, however, that's still not enough because the major flood control dams and reservoirs were not really improved. So, and those were tested beyond their design limits. So this is going to get worse and we haven't even dealt with the true cost of this yet. Climate change is going to make the next events even worse, potentially. And I'm going to uh, give a, a, a disclaimer. Yes, it's true that you can't say that these floods are due to climate change specifically, but the incidence of these type of events is correlated with increased moisture carrying capacity in the atmosphere, which is due to climate change. So the trend is real. This is going to keep happening. And you can't pin a specific event on climate change, but the trend, increasing floods, that's happening. And that is correlated to climate change. Then there's uh, droughts is the other uh, big acute effect, which to people that aren't farming, that's not, it seems subtle to them. But my wife and I were enjoying uh, a walk in uh, northwest of Ithaca, which is the red area in this map. And this was in 2016. 90% of the state was under abnormally dry or moderate drought conditions. And a huge swath in central New York, which is part of the agricultural district, uh, of New York was under severe drought. It was so bad that we saw green leaves falling from trees in the forests. So, and when you see this in July, that's not good because trees are still trying to uh, store energy into their uh, trunks and root systems. They need to keep their leaves through the growing season. Another subtle effect is my wife and I both enjoy gardening. The gardening zones, the planting zones, in terms of how cold it gets in the winter on average, those have shifted northward now roughly about 70 miles or more in some places. And that's one thing if, if this was something you could rely on. But the problem that comes with climate change, too, is that you, this is averages. What's happening now is where you get really erratic conditions. So sometimes you end up with really super cold spells 
because the jet stream, which is the river of air that's uh, high in the atmosphere, which guides a lot of the weather systems, that now, the amplitude, that wave is like a sine wave, like a snake. It, it's getting taller. And it sometimes, it's supposed to move west to east in a normal, predictable pattern. And sometimes that west to east movement of that sine wave, it stops in one spot. And when that happens, cold Arctic air can get dragged all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So then here, we could end up with minus 20, minus 25 degrees, which is way colder than what these maps say we're supposed to get. And the other thing that's happening now, too, with climate change is you might have a drought, and then that might get interrupted by a horrendous thunderstorm that drops three or four inches of rain in one hour or two hours. And if a farmer s sits and waits, he's trying to gamble with what is happening, he might be waiting okay, there's a drought, I'm going to plant. And then he plants because he sees the forecast that there's going to be some rains, the drought's going to end. He just finished planting, and now horrendous uh, uh, rainfall comes down and washes his, his uh, seeds or small young plant shoots away and erodes his soil away too. So this is hurting agriculture in New York State as well. And across the Midwest right now, too. The, the mainstream media isn't covering this in anywhere near enough, but that's the end of what I wanted to present. I just, it's just an overview. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we're ahead of schedule, which is fine, because I think we'll uh, be able to take questions later and uh, fill in a little bit about some actions, um, political actions. So uh, what's left then is uh, hearing about the divestment effort and then the Brindisi Town Hall and uh, some of the politics that we have to deal with. So let's go down to Isabel. Hello. Um, so thank you for that. I think that was a really great way of showing how this global problem has really local effects um, and they can't be separated. Um, so going back to the four R's that we talked about earlier, our framework for understanding how to approach the climate crisis, I personally really appreciate it because instead of just saying something like the environment is important, it gives us um, specific types of action to follow. So coming out of our workshop series, we had talked a lot, but we needed um, like direct and tangible applications of our discussions. So we formed breakout groups and one of those was divestment. And that's sort of what I um, have, have been focusing on in the months since. Um, but another question that I've been dealing with is as Binghamton University students who are temporary members of this community for the most part, um, what is appropriate for us to do um, and how do we better um, connect with the community because in the years past there has been a deep divide between community members and community organizations and student groups. Part of that is intentional on behalf of the administration. Um, it's intentional in the way our school, uh, our school is located, its architecture, even where throughways are um, were designed um, back in the day um, to sort of dissolve um, sort of student action. Um, but there's still been really important, uh, you know, student activism during like the Vietnam War, during um, apartheid in South Africa. So we do have sort of um, a legacy that we can build on. Um, but I'm really concerned with having a better relationship with the community. So I'm really glad that we're able to be here today um, and meet you guys and talk to you and build from here. Um, because in the past, like even a few years ago, there's a really well-intentioned student group. Um, that you know wanted to that was given a policy platform that directly um, delegated university money to police departments and it was a really problematic thing because no one in the community was uh, given any choice in that so I want to make sure that as students as much as we care um, that we're learning from you guys and figuring out what you actually want and not just applying what we think you want, right? So that's just my preface. Um, and I think speaking to that, where students have failed in the past is by not centering our own complicity, right? So if investments reveal sort of ideological endorsements, 
Um, and Binghamton University is one of uh, Broome County's largest financial institutions, then divestment is the ultimate relinquishment, right? So our endowment is over $152 million and we get more in returns, right? So that's a massive amount of money that comes from donations that are meant for students um, and a little bit of our student fees goes into that fund as well. It's private, so even though we're a public university, we're not allowed to know um, exactly where that money is being invested. So what we're working on right now is before we even divest from things we don't like, we need to know what's happening and where this money is going. Um, so right now we're working on transparency, but the, there has been a divestment campaign in the past um, following the trend of colleges across the country that have asked their universities and demanded from their universities um, to divest from fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, but our university a few years ago said, you know what, we divested, it's all good. Um, they provided no proof and the group sort of died down, so it's really important that we're bringing this back up. Um, so, you know, we've also added um, other kinds of ethical investments and divestments um, into our conversation. Um, Binghamton University has really deep ties with um, lots of uh, arms manufacturers and whether or not you personally think that's okay, um, it should be up to the students to determine where that money is going. So if we understand climate change as a symptom of a globalized system of production that concentrates um, benefits in the hands of a few while socializing costs upon the most vulnerable around the world, um, we can see that ex an extractive division of labor is maintained through debt and dependency. Um, we see that in terms of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and when that fails, military occupation. So my earliest memory, um, or one of them in terms of politics, is the Iraq War. So that's for you guys to understand the generation we're growing up with. That, that is our understanding of war. Um, when you look at uh, how the Department of Defense, along with the companies it contracts with, it's the top polluter on the planet, um, and it's half of our federal budget, right? So even the language that we're using, w when you know young, poor young people are sent away to war to benefit the state and come back and don't even receive health care that they deserve, who are we defending, right? When the earth is dying and th our state is benefiting from it, who are we defending, right? So that's what I think George was speaking to earlier, how much language changes the way we understand the problem and the solutions. So, you know, if to, we need radical changes and radicalism as defined by activist Angela Davis is grabbing things by the root. Um, we need to look at the root of this global economic system. Um, and you can go all the way back to the first days of colonization um, of the Americas, where cultural values of domination over nature were intimately related uh, to the things that happened, right? So land and their inhabitants were racialized. Um, people were devalued because they were closer to nature. Um, and their sustainable lifestyles were erased through forced assimilation, right? So all the solutions that might have been there and that we can still draw upon were forcibly erased and violently erased so that we can live the way we do now, right? So that this is a historical process that we, um, as Americans, and especially if you're a white American, um, benefit from still. So we just need to be aware of that language and of that, of that history um, and understand that land, war, environment, chemicals, all these things are really, really intimately connected and to just focus on the environment as a separate thing that's distinct from culture rather than a thing we should all be participants in and that we're all a part of because we're all animals, right? Like, that's a really important cultural unlearning that we need to all undergo and it's hard and it's emotional, right? Because it may not always necessarily feel like, oh, this is something we directly benefit from, but if the country that we live in did benefit from it, then we are benefiting, right? Like every time we drive down a highway built with public money, right? So. That's sort of where we're coming from when we've incorporated this idea of um, war machines into divestment. Um, and I think how our university functions should, mineral, should mirror um, the government, right? So instead of putting all our money into militarism, into fossil fuels, we should be investing in the solutions, right? And in terms of Binghamton, right, what I think is really important is um, 
investing in local initiatives like Vines, for example, if they had even a tiny fraction of the money that our university invests, think about all the people that could be fed, um, all the soil that could be restored, um, all the cultural and like communal, communal sovereignty that could be grown, right? I think it's really important that our university, if it wants to maintain its proposed values of global mindedness, of excellence, of all these really nice things, it has to put its money where its mouth is, right? So we need to relinquish um, obstruction and manipulation of information in favor of consensus, in favor of informed consent. We cannot profit of, off of climate change in the year 2019. It is ridiculous. Um, it is unfair. It is unjust. Um, and we need to recover by, like I said, reinvesting locally, um, reinvesting in clean energy, and you know, reinvesting in this community, which is suffering and it's being ignored um, in favor of special interest groups, like you were mentioning before. So that's um, our divestment campaign. It's just starting, but you know, we have a long, long way to go. There's a lot of institutional measures um, in between us and that goal, but we're going to work really hard on it because. I think that is where it's appro most appropriate for me to work is the place that I go to school, right? I can't say, you know, necessarily what someone else should do somewhere else, but where I go to school, it really matters to me that um, that it's it's ethical. So yeah, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's going to be a multiple-year effort yeah. uh, for sure. Um, the the other major effort this semester at least that is coming out of that came out of the workshops um it actually kind of is st starting before that so last semester during the uh election this is before there's any talk about anything like a green new deal that at the time the most the most bold uh piece of climate legislation was called the off act the off fossil fuels act i think it was um uh introduced by Tulsi Gabbard, I'm not sure. Um, but during the election, we collected 1,500 signatures on a student letter in support of that and delivered it to both candidates. And we talked to Anthony Brindisi, and he, he said he would come to campus uh, f for a forum on climate change during the election. And then he didn't, and then a uh, winter break happened, and then he had a town hall, and, and we met with him after the town hall, uh, and, he, and he said, yeah, I'm going to come to campus. Here's my uh, email. And we emailed him. He didn't come. Uh, and then I think like there's like two more things. We had like a rally at his office. Uh, and then finally, uh, he agreed to come for 45 minutes. We're going to stretch it to an hour. We're going to stretch it to an hour. <laughs> so the event's going to be uh, next Thursday from 7 to 9. Uh, the first 30 minutes is going to be 20 minutes of two professors. Uh, Professor Carl Lipo, he's an anthropologist and he runs the Environmental Studies Department. And Professor Molly Patterson, who's a uh, climate scientist, she does work in Antarctica. And um, they're going to be uh, talking for audience members who don't, might not know as much about these issues, uh, what climate change means today for the world and for Broome County, like you were talking about, um, and what different, different scenarios will mean. Um, and then we're going to, and then the second section of the event, is going to be about 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to go over a, uh, a student vision that we've outlined in the letter. Um, I think there were some going around the audience. I'm not sure if anyone got a chance, but I'll give the kind of overview. Um, right now, the only the the only plan that has the urgency required for this situation is the Green New Deal. But the Green New Deal is also very vague. So when when we were writing this letter, we didn't want to just say uh, we support a Green New Deal. We wanted to say we support these specific changes. And also, um, it, there are things that the, that the Green New Deal conversation is missing. So, for instance, in the movement from proposal to resolution for the Green New Deal, they took out what I think is the most important part. They took out the mandate to halt all new fossil fuel infrastructure projects and limit production. So as long as we're building pipelines and and extracting more oil and gas uh, and coal, uh, we're not going to meet these climate limits. That expansion is incompatible. And they took that out because it was too controversial. So if the Green New Deal doesn't include that, we, we don't want Brindisi to support a Green Deal. We want Brindisi to support whatever includes 
the stuff in this letter. And if that's a Green New Deal, that's amazing. Likely, whatever passes will be under something like that. Um, the other reason that reform is most important is because it changes the uh, the um, it frees up a lot of creative energy. So right now, going back to the four R's: resistance, resilience, relinquishment, and restoration. Uh, activists across the country are putting all their efforts into resistance, and often it's not very successful because there's not enough of us. Um, if there was a federal mandate to halt all new infrastructure projects that frees up a lot of creative energy energies to pursue the things that people really want to be doing, which is the uh, building the alternatives. Um, so that's why that's important, and that's why that, that has to be included in a Green New Deal. Um, the other major difference between this vision and the one being proposed is uh, we take a systems perspective, not just looking at how we generate electricity, but how we how, how we generate energy, but how we use energy, um, and the inefficiencies and the, the gross inefficiencies on a systems level, right? So, if ag going back to agriculture, and we're going to be talk, and the letter emphasizes agriculture a lot because Anthony Brindisi is on the uh, the House committee. Globally, agriculture is responsible directly for 12 percent of carbon emissions, but the food system, due to transportation production processing production of inputs and deforestation is responsible for more than half of carbon emissions so when you take that systems perspective then it it's not just about substituting renewable energies wherever possible but it's about restructuring economies uh, relocalizing economies to reduce energy usage and that's kind of a big emphasis and a big change perspective that we think needs to happen in this in the conversations about climate change because it's not clear that we can build out renewables um, in time to meet clim uh, to climate limits, especially since energy demand it continues to increase so rapidly. Um, so to the letter the, the the letter has a introduction that's just talking about why it's so important. As a one-page summary of the core principles and strategies of our vision, I'm going to read that in a second. Um, then it has two pages contextualizing the climate crisis as part of a broader ecological crisis and kind of giving the urgency there. Two pages outlining guiding principles and considerations for climate action. Uh, and three pages detailing structural changes like I talked about that need to happen sector by sector to meet climate goals. And those sectors um, include uh, energy, um, Food and agriculture, transportation, buildings, healthcare, manufacturing, information and communications, uh, as well as land management, ecosystem restoration is going to be very important, uh, and 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 um, military and related industries. Disaster preparedness is also a major emphasis in this letter, and corporate responsibility and global cooperation. Uh, I'm just going to read the summary really quick. So these are the core principles and strategies. First. We need to halt all new fossil fuel infrastructure projects and limit further fossil fuel production because oil and gas expansion is incompatible with climate limits. Second, we need to manage the decline to net zero carbon emissions before 2030. Um, according to international scientific consensus, this is necessary to avoid worst case climate scenarios. Globally, we need to cut emissions by half within that time, but in industrialized nations like the US, where carbon emissions are uh, that produced the vast amount of carbon emissions historically and continue to today. It, happens, it has to happen much rapidly. So we're saying net zero before 2030. We need to substitute fossil fuels with renewable energy technologies wherever possible and appropriate. So these are becoming cheaper and more efficient. They could uh, provide a significant portion of energy use this decade. Um, but renewables cannot replace fossil fuels in every use, and they come with environmental costs of their own. Um, batteries will likely never have the energy density of oil. So shipping, trucking, and airlines, or, or at least even the most optimistic estimates say that's not going to happen for decades. So shipping, uh, trucking, and airlines, um, in those kinds of uh, heavy-duty sectors, oil is not a substitute resource. We need to, so in those kinds of approaches, we need to reduce, that comes means reducing energy consumption across those sectors um, through, structural through structural changes. Uh, how we use energy is just as important as how we produce energy. Uh, then we need to sequester carbon through regenerative land management. 
By restoring, by restoring degraded landscapes, we can store massive amounts of carbon emissions at low cost and no risk. These efforts will also lessen the impact and severity of droughts, floods, and severe weather while fostering biodiversity. They will be achieved largely through changes in agricultural practices, but also through ecosystem restoration. And to do this, we'll have to restore farm communities. So over the last few centuries, more than half the world's soil carbon has been released into the atmosphere. That's the largest uh, carbon sink. Uh, so alternative practices that rebuild soils can capture massive amounts of carbon and will be central to addressing and possibly reversing climate change. A uh, 2014 study by the Rodale Institute, which is a uh, sustainable agriculture center, um, extrapolating from their best field trials across uh, different parts of the world, rege uh, regenerative agriculture has the potential to sequester all global carbon emissions, all annual emissions uh, today. I mean, obviously, it would take several years to transition to that, but it's a existing, these are existing and, and proven techniques. Uh, so these same practices also restore aquifers, reduce pollution, foster biodiversity, and they also, they're also more resilient to climate change. Uh, so, to, but to promote these changes, we must decentralize food systems and train, train and equip millions of young farmers. Um, we're emphasizing these things, obviously. Again, he's on the committee. Um, then promoting resilience. So at this late stage, as you were talking about, many of the effects of climate change are already happening and, will, and uh, their intensification is unavoidable. A one degree is warming above pre-industrial levels. Extreme weather disease, migration, and crop failures are being felt. While working to avert catastrophe, we must also prepare our communities for those effects that are locked in. Uh, we have to emphasize environmental justice. Uh, so these changes are necessary. Everyone has to make huge changes to their lives, their thinking. Um, but they're all, and this is going to be costly and difficult. But the burden must fall uh, uh, m most on those who have most profited off and directed this crisis. And vulnerable communities must be protected. And this is global impl implications. Uh, and lastly, deepening democracy. So fossil fuel funded officials shouldn't be writing climate policy. Democratic reforms that empower communities are necessary to enact bold and effective change. Uh, we will not avert catastrophe without structural shifts in power. So that's ki th those are the core principles and strategies of our letter. Uh, and um, they should be being, pa I guess they were being passed around at some point. So if anyone has any questions, they can ask me more afterwards. Um, so at the event, so we'll be talking about this for ten, f for 10 to 15 minutes. Then Anthony Brindisi from 7.30 to 8.30, and we're going to try and hold him longer, is going to be answering audience questions. There'll be four prepared questions. The first question will be a, a, introducing some of these statistics and asking him if he supports the Green New Deal, and if not, what alternative uh, strategies and approaches does he em endorse, and why does he find that preferable? The second question is going to be focusing on agriculture as a source of carbon emissions as a sector uh, uh, very vulnerable to climate change and as a area where a lot of potential for uh, reversing some of these effects um, and asking him how he as a, mem as a uh, um, part member of the House Committee on Agriculture plans to transform our food system to be de to rap to plans to rapidly decarbonize our food system secure like the U.S.'s food supply in the face of these difficulties um, and restore farm communities. Uh, the third question that we have prepared is about the local effects in Broome County, how he plans to, uh, how he plans to uh, protect rural communities like Broome County, rural regions like Broome County from these, from these uh, pr protect and pr prepare rural, these kind of regions for uh, these changes. And the last question is about cooperating with students. Um, a lot of student groups and some of the student groups that are organizing this event put a lot of effort into the uh, election. I think everyone on this table volunteered and I, I registered voters and stuff. Uh, he likely wouldn't have been elected without massive turnouts on campus. Uh, and w because it's an issue that is so important to young people, we're asking him how he plans to work more closely with us in the future and how we can best facilitate that relationship. So w we've sent him these questions and these are the questions he, he has an opportunity to give a prepared response to. Uh, this is his chance to impress us. Like, he gets to do his research, prepare a statement, and sound really good. Uh, and then there'll be audience questions that, that uh, hopefully will be a little tougher and a little bit more emotional. Um, and those can go on as long as possible. Uh, at some point, he'll, he'll have to leave, and he'll, he'll 
uh, say that, and then we're going to have a debrief uh, to see what we could do f next. And any audience members who would like to be part of that debrief could stay. Anyone who wants to leave could leave. So that's what the event is going to be. Uh, it's next Thursday from 7 to 9 on the second floor of the University Union. It's a large room. It's, um, it's like very wide and kind of sh shallow, I guess. It's like a 200, the occupancy is like 200. I don't know how many people are going to come. We're doing, uh, we've done outreach on campus. We're going to start doing outreach in the community uh, tomorrow. And I think you guys are going to help us with that. Um, yeah, tell your friends. That's it. Oh, there might be food. <laughs> so UU209? Yeah, yeah, UU209. And there are flyers on that table over there. It's up there. Uh, it's on the second floor. That's it. I don't. I didn't really have anything else to say. Uh, there's a, a sheet here that there's several copies on the table too. This is basically hoping that everybody in this audience at least makes a phone call to Representative Brindisi, as well as others. Uh, New York has two senators. Please call them. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt right now. CCPA is uh, a bill that's like a miniature version of uh, the, uh, what is it, in my back? Is it, what's on my back? Does it say CCPA? Oh, New York Renews is on my back. But anyway, what this shirt is about is the Climate and Community uh, Protection Act, which is sort of a New York State version of the Green New Deal. It's a little bit more specific, but smaller in terms of its ambition um, and focus but it's a real thing that has been negotiated for years and now that the New York State government is controlled by Democrats all of it is controlled by Democrats uh, you know both the uh, branches of the legislature as well as the governorship there is no more excuse so please call uh, uh, Senator Akshar uh, try to urge him to pass, you know, vote for the uh, Climate and Community Protection Act, at CCPA, um, and also Donna Lupardo, she's already on board, but it doesn't hurt for her to hear this too. Um, and then the governor's office especially, because there's a little bit of doubt that, you know, whether he'll truly sign it, depending on what's in it, uh, at the end, because people might still add amendments to it. Uh, so that's what you can do locally, and then, uh, Hopefully, when Congressman Brindisi comes to campus, you have a chance to ask questions, too. So tell your friends, neighbors, people you work with uh, that please come. It's a chance to speak with your congressman up on the most important issue of our time and of our future, which is climate change. This is not getting enough attention, and our window is sh closing. We've, since the report was issued at the uh, International Pan Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, in October. They gave us 12 years at that point. We've already chewed up seven months of that 12 years. And we can't even get people that are in the Democratic Party to, cl to get on board with agreeing to stop fossil fuel infrastructure ex expansion and signing on to the Green New Deal, despite the fact that it's fairly vague and it, it doesn't really commit anybody to specifically do anything at this point. It's just a statement of principles. Why can't Democrats sign on to this? So please make calls to your New York State senators and uh, Representative Brinzizi as well. I've been calling him every week now for two months, uh, trying to get him to come to campus and to try to get him to answer the question. And I got a response from him that basically was kind of a blow off in a way. The key sentences that were in there, he, in the beginning he says that He's got young children that he cares about. He cares about their future. Uh, but then he goes on and says, however, I believe Congress must focus on legislation that can gain support from both parties. <laughs> well, so how long are we going to wait until both parties decide to do something? Then another statement stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, he says, I will keep your comments in mind should legislation on this topic come up for a vote. Like it's going to come up on its own without anybody pushing for it? I mean, it's just not going to magically appear and then everybody's going to jump on board and pass it. So you in the audience, these students have done a lot of work. And this is really commendable. 
what they're doing here. They didn't get any course credit for this. They're not making money off of this. It's because they care about the future. Please support them and make phone calls. Please, if you've got time, go make a protest sign and show up at a protest. Please do it. Thank you. And uh, could you ask, could you bring that email to the event and ask that as an audience question? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so that email that Volley referred to, there's some of these sheets back on the table there that, that deal with the, someone, uh, the exchange, the, just a pared down version of it. And it's got uh, two numbers at the bottom to call Anthony Brindisi. Um, there's also another sheet on the table if you want to take a little bit of what you've heard from our panel of the young people here with, uh, with some other good points about the special report on global warming that uh, the IPCC just released. And uh, one thing in bold here, it says we reject the notion that real change is beyond reach even in this difficult political climate. <coughs> Excuse me. And urge you to publicly and forcefully advocate for the passage of bold climate legislation. So there's another sheet uh, you can take if you want to refer to that. And then uh, Valdi mentioned the Climate and Community Protection Act. We got some half sheets back there. Um, and uh, there's a phone number in the bottom to call Senator Akshar. So this is uh, looking very positive that it will pass in, in New York State. But it doesn't go far enough. It's a good start. Um, it's not going to get us totally on the, the path to uh, avoiding the 1.5 degree centigrade temperature rise. Um, but uh, we still want to pass this. So if you want to pick up one of these, they're on the table. Um, and uh, I'm going to pass it down the, the, the mic to anyone here that wants to add anything right now before we maybe go to questions from the audience no we're, we're good okay so um, why don't we do this I, I'm, I'm sure there's some questions out there and we've only of course touched on things uh, lightly or um, slightly I should say um, but if you ask your question you can direct it to one of the panel members or to anybody. And whoever's going to answer it, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question into the mic, because otherwise it doesn't get picked up by the video. So who would like to either question or comment? Yes, the young lady back there. And the, that's you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so her question was, um, are we preparing a formal request um, in regards to transparency and divestment? Um, so right now we are trying to schedule a meeting with him. It's extremely difficult, but um, there's apparently one opening um, during the finals week in May, um, which is a very convenient time to pick, right? <laughs> But we, are, we have written a letter um, demanding transparency and explaining why we think it's important. We're collecting signatures on it right now. Um, and we're going to be going to groups um, and asking for their support um, you know, under the banner of you know, maybe some student organizations that have more clout. Um, but yeah, we definitely need to work on getting more signatures so that when we show up to that meeting, you know, he'll be impressed. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's what we have so far.
the, the this in the car so right here. So <laughs> he, he's asking about uh, population issues. And um, I think it's, n it's not talked about so much because of political reasons and because of historical reasons. And, it's, and that's not such a bad thing. Um, I don't think it should be the primary issue. Um, a good way to think about it is is a population of humans. There's also a population of cars and cell phones. There's a population of televisions. There's a population of airplanes. It's a population of cargo ships. And these are all things that have metabolisms, expend energy, consume resources, and produce waste. So bef so as um, people who are, from a global perspective, very privileged, living in um, uh, a country that consumes mo more resources than any other one, um, at least especially consumption-based, the fir our first priority should be our, sh our first focus should be over consumption and that's and that's a issue that we can address much more ethically and on, on a much shorter term than we can address overpopulation um, not that over not that the population question is not a problem but the population question is is a much more difficult issue to tackle and a much more long-term issue to tackle uh, a quarter of the population has negative car of the world population is negative carbon emissions uh, and the bottom 10% it, uh, is uh, because they're like living in farming practices where they're storing carbon in the soil. 10% um, of people are responsible for 50% of carbon emissions. So overconsumption is more is a more immediate and uh, easier to tackle issue than overpopulation. Um, The other problem you get into with if if we as say the United States or the developed world uh, more at large say Europe and uh, you know Canada depending on what countries you want to throw in there if we now say to the rest of the world that you can't have any more babies or you can only have two babies or whatever we dictate to people that's sort of people are going to look at us like wow you know you you took this nation and you changed it radically and your methods and industrialization and your war machines and everything have affected the rest of the planet to the point now where you're having trouble yourselves and now you're asking us meaning the rest of the world not to have enough you know babies that they maybe they only want to have two babies or or maybe they feel they need to have more babies because they still worry about sickness and, and children dying off what tends to happen with populations is as medical care and hygiene and safe water, clean drinking water improves and people see that the children they have will live to adulthood and into a, you know, a nice level, a, a nice age of adulthood, not just reaching the 20s, then within a, a few generations the population growth in that area falls. So it tends to happen anyway, but it takes decades for that to happen. So that's partly why it's not being talked about. It's a great question. And ideally speaking, yes, it would be great if everybody just decided to only have one child for the next few generations. That would be a big help. But I don't think we're in a position ethically or morally to tell the rest of the planet, especially third world, to do this. So thank you for the question, though. I just want to expand on that. Um, we were actually talking about this on the car ride here, so <laughs> it's really funny that you mentioned that. Um, I think we, we talked about how different countries have different um, needs in terms of like how they're going to combat climate change. I actually lived in Israel for the past year in a gap year, and I worked with an environmentalist called, his name is Alon Tal, and that's his like main mission is to um, combat overpopulation in Israel, and that's like definitely their, like in Israel, that's their hurdle that they have to overcome. Um, but I think in other countries, maybe there's different hurdles that might suit this issue better. I don't know. Like if those other countries uh, wanted to address it within their own, and those other uh, uh, within their own borders, th that would be great, and the U.S. should uh, assist that. But the U.S. should not be telling other countries to control their population 
while we consume more resources than any other country in the world. So that's the thing is 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 it it's something that needs to be addressed, but it's not the biggest problem, and it's not and we should not and that's and that's not where we need to lead. We need to lead on on um, uh, the cons on the reducing emissions. Yeah, and just a short thought on that. Um, I believe China used to have a one-child policy um, and now doesn't. Um, and their argument has sort of been like, okay, as we're um, becoming more incorporated into the global market and we're trying to compete more with countries like the United States, um, why should you be allowed to pollute and have a lot of children and all these kinds of things and we're not? So maybe a better thing to do would be instead of uh, telling other countries what to do would be like George is saying, set a better example, right? So if they're thinking that the only way to have economic success or a high quality of life is to um, like imitate the systems that we have, maybe we just need to change those systems and other countries will follow suit. Um, and in the Green New Deal, it actually says that um, in the United States, we should be promoting the international exchange of technology, expertise, products, funding, and services with the aim of making the United States the international leader on climate action and to help other countries achieve a Green New Deal. So if, if we're going to be helpful to the the global the global problem we have um, we need to be uh, both a leader and a uh, setting a good example if you're worried about uh, overconsumption which we're all guilty of why do we uh, uh, why have we allowed 13 million immigrants cross our southern border and increase their carbon footprint by doing so by double, triple, quadruple, whatever because of their opportunities here in their new way of living. So, <laughs> yeah, he's asking um, uh, why are we letting immigrants live American lifestyles? Uh, if that means increasing their carbon emissions. Um, I think this gets back to another thing we are talking about in the car where everyone's responsible for these things. Some people are responsible a lot more than other people, but no one wants to take responsibility. So everyone shifts to blame someone else. So before we start talking about developing countries and what they need to do, before we start talking about what immigrants need to do, we need to start talking about what we need to do. Uh, especially from a historical perspective. And the other thing I would say to that is, when I, when I said overconsumption, I didn't just mean on an individual level. I'm talking about systems. Going back to agriculture, that's a, our food system is grossly wasteful. That doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't, make, give, it doesn't give people healthier food. Our food is losing nutritional value. It doesn't give people more food. People are still going hungry and huge amounts of food is being wasted. So overconsumption is as much a systems level uh, issue, a structural level, level issue is, is an individual thing. It's not about, um, it's not about not having prosperity. It's about having, trying to um, achieve prosperity in a way that is less grossly wasteful. Um, another thing to point out, and th this is that a lot of the immigration uh, across the border um, is due to climate change and a lot of it is due to agribusiness expanding and pushing peasants off their land where they were living in a they're living prosperous lives um, self uh, uh, and were forced into poverty and now they're farm workers uh, exposed to huge health hazards exposed to uh, uh, economic uh, and uh, often sexual exploitation on these on these sites. So, m a lot a lot of the immigrants working on these farms, their lives are not improving. Their communities are being broken up by agribusiness, or or they're being forced to move because of climate change uh, and other environmental issues. And they're coming into the U.S. and they're the bottom rung. So again, we should not be saying 
these other people, what, what, what do they have to do? We should be saying, what do we have to do? And that's, and what's a pro, like, where do we stand in this situation historically, politically, economically? I'm speaking for myself because I don't know everyone in this room's background. Right? So, um, and, and how do we make change here? How do we make change here now? And, and we can't expect anyone else to do it unless we're doing it. So that is an important, like, that is, in, that is a good question. But it's a systems thing. It's not an individual thing. And it's, um, and it's a, I don't know. Is that, I have lost what I was saying. Um, so yeah, um, I would just like to say that like my mom is a Muslim, like brown skin immigrant from the Middle East. Um, her parents grew up um, in different areas, but they were agricultural, they were rural. Um, and because of the sort of systems, the economic systems that we've been talking about, were forced into slums in a city. Um, she didn't have running water growing up. And so there was a lot of incentives to immigrate, right? So like George is saying, like we've been talking about, it has to be a systems understanding, it has to be a global understanding, and we can't blame people for wanting to live lives that are, that are you know, healthy and that are happy. We need a lot, we need a lot of small farmers, and there's gonna be a lot of uh, displaced uh, peasants, so maybe we could give them land and they could and teach them how to do regenerative agriculture and they could store some so store some soil carbon Just to follow up on, on the immigration question a Lot of the mi mass migration that is happening right now planet-wide from the heart of Africa where there used to be a lot more farming and it and the weather was more stable and people could grow crops they didn't have huge droughts the desert is expanding in Central Africa. Farmers are giving up. That's a huge driver of mass migration of generally the adult males going to Europe right now. That's climate change. It's climate change is driving that. Middle East, Syria, that civil war and the, the, the basically the collapse of the Syrian government and the rise of terrorism and mass conflict there that was driven to a large extent by climate change, which had a, an extended six-year drought in Syria. So farmers gave up en masse and migrated to the big cities saying, what can we do to support our families? They started protesting. When protesting was met with mass crackdowns by the Syrian government, then eventually they thought, okay, the government's gonna, not going to listen to us. What are we going to do? Well, violence breaks out. Then when violence breaks out, then the families say, well, we can't stay here anymore. They want to move. So this, this is the leading edge of what you're going to see is the breakdown of civilization if this is allowed to continue for another few decades. It's not going to just be a pockets here and there. The food system that relies on fishing from the ocean is going to start collapsing too. So hundreds of millions of people that get most of their protein from fishing, not just fish, but also shellfish, clams, shrimp. That's, they're having trouble building their shells. They're made out of limestone, which uh, when the ocean is too acidic, they can't build shells that support their bodies. This is happening now. Coral reefs are dying. This is a, a, a very diverse ecosystem that supports lots of different kinds of fish. And humans are adding pollution on top of this. Plus, the temperature is also making it so that the oceans can't carry enough oxygen either. So fish themselves are having trouble living. So that's just my take on what's happening. So anyway, sorry. I'm glad you mentioned coral reefs because uh, that's one of the aspects that really, that's a statistic, I have a statistic that really demonstrates the urgency of 1.5 degrees as a limit rather than 2 degrees as a limit. Um, even though 1.5 degrees is much more difficult uh, to, to stay within at, the, at this late stage, but at 1.5 degrees, 90% of coral reefs will die out. It means 10% are remaining. At 2 degrees, 99 or percent or all of coral reefs will die out by 2100. That's the difference between um, almost no coral reefs remaining or 10% of coral reefs remaining. And since that's the basis, that's the basis of that all the rest of aquatic 
biodiversity builds upon, that's a huge difference, right? We talk about food production. Crop losses will double between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. Um, so th I, I, thanks for the reminder of ur the urgency of this situation. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. I got a bunch of comments. Comments. I'll try to just limit do you want to yeah, take the mic? Yeah. And then we have sure. uh, yeah. First of all, we talk a lot about trying to change institutional systems, and I think you know we'd have to do that. But I also think that um, just every aspect of our personal lives is also important, and I think that we need to think about everything we do, from the big things. Uh, like families, cars, et cetera, houses, down to the little things, too. And um, I just think that's an ethical necessity for anyone who's advocating lots of changes. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, as a biologist and naturalist, um, I'm, I just love the diversity of nature. E.O. Wilson, the great sort of um, guru of... Um, of conservation has said that there's three kinds of wealth in the world. I mean, this is obviously a big generalization, but number one is material wealth. Number two is cultural wealth, you know, all of our art and Notre Dame Cathedral, et cetera. And, uh, but thirdly, he says biological wealth <coughs> and the, the biodiversity on, on the earth. And um, I think that should be just a major motivation, too. I hope you'll say that, oh, but yeah, if we can solve climate change, we'll solve a lot of the biodiversity problems. But we need to think of it from the point of view of biodiversity as well. OK, third thing I kind of want to say is that um, uh, we've got a lot of problems with the economic system. And you've uh, you know, alluded to all of these. But we've got a system. Um, and it's uh, basically capitalism. I think there's some good aspects of capitalism. Um, but what it always seems to do is emphasize growth, more growth. Uh, you know, growth is good um, without a sort of another thought. And, uh, you know, for instance, um, China is now worried about the fact that they had this one child policy for so many years. and. Uh, the, um, the population is aging, and it's becoming less productive. And uh, so that's why they've abandoned the one-child principle, because they want to grow. And uh, Japan is, uh, is very vitally worried about their growth. Um, so here's a question. Uh, what do we do about all this? I mean, it's a basic e economic system we have that emphasizes growth is good and rewards growth. So um, can we m um, mo modify that somehow? Um, so your first comment was talking about like uh, personal changes that we can make. Uh, that can contribute towards our, our reversal of climate change. And I think um, that was a, a really uh, big principle that we tried attacking with these um, workshops. So all five of us are actually in a number of organizations on campus uh, that work to tackle you know, smaller uh, personal level problems uh, in regards to climate change, such as uh, using reusable water bottles or uh, the amount of plastic we use in the dining halls. Um, and we've tried, uh, quite hard, I would say, to try and reverse that. Um, but specifically, we wanted to take a direction that looked at the big system. But I, I'm, I'm glad you're, importing, uh, you're, you're highlighting the importance of that. Um, and we, 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 we always try to uh, you know, bring up those, those ways where, in which we can you know, make those personal changes. Um, but I think the realization is that, that that's quite difficult uh, to do without making a broader uh, social system change. Um, so I, I appreciate how you brought that up. And then, uh, do you want to talk, George? Or? OK. Um, and then what was your second comment again? Remind me. Yes. Um, so another comment that I wanted to make earlier is, uh, I'm glad you also said that, is that I think um, one of the largest incentives for uh, taking action on climate change is the fact that it's 
it's not even it's not only a threat to the planet's health but it's also it's also a threat to our health um i think if i'm to be direct if you were to shove that in a politician's face and say this is a, this is a this is a health threat to the greater population as a whole um that that could actually spur some change um and i think that definitely needs to be recognized more um when it comes to uh highlighting the causes and the effects of climate change um and like i've said multiple times it's a it's a great uh it's a great cause it's a great incentive um and then i'm sorry what was your third comment again economics, economics. Okay, um, so we actually, <laughs> that's a very complex question, um, obviously, <laughs> and I certainly don't have a PhD in it, um, <laughs> um, but earlier, uh, we were talking in the car, that's actually why we were partially late to this event, because we were having a little powwow about it. Um, we, we personally think that you can't match growth with growth, um, and that's a very tough thing to talk about and confront nowadays with the current uh, capitalistic system that we have. Um, and we specifically talked about how a lot of the time nowadays growth is met, uh, growth that uh, seeks to uh, reverse climate change is usually met with more growth that um, causes climate change. Um, so I, I forget what our specific example was. Um, oh, uh, we talked about, we talked about the desalinization of water in Israel. Um, so they're they're having a very uh, large demand for fresh water, um, and their water surpluses are quite frankly running out. Um, so they've implemented this very large plan to uh, construct desalinization uh, plants to m produce more fresh water. And as a result, they've seen more consumption of fresh water, which is leading to a higher a higher demand and more the the, high, the lesser surpluses of fresh water. Um, so to tie that back in. Um, it's it's really difficult to uh, confront the idea of growth, um, and I think uh, we we need to instill that idea that growth is not always good, um, and we need to kind of reverse that whole ideology and that whole policy. Um, how exactly we do that is a very difficult situation, a very complex uh, a complex issue. Um, but yeah, that that that's my two cents on it. Um. I think we have to confront growth, um, but also yeah, I think you have to con you have to understand uh, who is directing growth, what segments of society uh, d direct growth, and um, uh, there's an economist, Turbin Daly, who makes a distinguishment between economic growth and uneconomic growth. So the idea is that if the economy is an open subsystem within a finite biosphere, economic growth always implies environmental costs. Uh, and as these costs grow, continuing expansion yields diminishing and eventually negative returns uh, because this infinite growth is uh, impossible on a finite planet. Um, but, be, but because the costs and benefits of growth are distributed disproportionately, political and economic decision makers will pursue growth at the expense of vulnerable groups and future generations. So we can't uh, confront growth without confronting economic uh, and global inequalities um, because it's those global inequalities that allow uh, for growth to continue even when uh, it poses huge costs to society at large. It's those inequalities that allow the costs of growth, growth to be externalized onto the developing world and onto the vulnerable communities here in the U.S. as well and the benefits of growth to be concentrated um, in the hands, right? And, and um, if we don't address those inequalities, the people who currently benefit from growth will continue to pursue growth uh, until there's like not, no, nowhere left to grow into. <laughs> so, um, unless we'll go to the moon. So, <laughs> so uh, there's we the the first guiding principle in our letter uh, is called beyond growth. And we say that if we do not confront the overconsumption on a systems level and overproduction at the root of this crisis, climate limits will likely be passed. This will lead to ecological collapse and leave surviving generations to struggle in a state of permanent degradation. We must find ways to achieve prosperity while slowing or reversing economic growth across certain sectors. Uh, this, will require, this will require confronting the, structure, the structural inequalities that result from and allow for elite-directed growth. 
So historically, gr economic growth is an elite directed process. Uh, and it, it needs economic inequality to continue when it becomes uneconomic. Um, and it creates economic, further economic inequality because the benefits are consolidated into the people directing it. So it's not just about growth, it's about unequal growth. It's about growth and the inequality that results from and allows for it. So I think those are two, that's the missing point. So, so if we're gonna confront growth, we also have to redistribute um, the benefits of past growth. That, that's kind of the idea. Yeah, so we actually had a workshop um, that looked at the Soviet oil crisis in Cuba um, in the 90s where basically 90% of their oil um, was gone overnight and their consumption habits stayed the same. Um, and before that, um, with a lot of Soviet support, Cuba was basically um, a bunch of gigantic industrial state-run farms. Um, they used more pesticides per capita than the U.S. They used more tractors per capita than the U.S. In no ways was it environmental, right? So um, after the crisis, they had to do a lot of reforms in a lot of different areas of society. Um, in Havana, there was a lot of urban farming, um, permaculture farming, um, food forests, um, that kind of ideology um, sort of spread. It was helpful because there was already a culture of solidarity um, that maybe we don't have here in the US. But we tried to look at that as a microcosm of what might happen in the coming decades. Um, and to try to see like what did they do to sort of maintain um, you know, any sort of stability in the face of this crisis, right? And a lot of their reforms had to do with decentralizing, right? So I don't think we're necessarily trying to dictate like it's capitalism or socialism or any of this. It's more about having people be in control of their communities, of having um, strong relationships with each other and the land in which you live. Um, and, you know, Indust industry, like wh whoever is benefiting from it, it's not good for the planet, right? So, so thinking about appropriate technologies um, for the place that you live, I think is is what we're trying to get at, um, and what we think is most important. If that helps you. <laughs> oh well, I was just gonna say, um, I just to touch on what George was talking about about the inequality of growth and then appropriate technologies is that. Um, with the inequality of growth, I think there's this perception that um, growth is always uh, a thing that is, we are in need of um, and that is always in demand of. Um, but we need to confront the fact that sometimes growth, like it's okay to not have growth. Um, some of some of the some of the countries on the planet with the lowest per capita. Uh, use of fossil fuels are developing countries, um, and they are sustaining themselves. Um, so I th I think it's it we talk about like the inequality of growth and how we need to redistribute growth but at the same time i think we need to think about the fact that uh sometimes growth simply is not necessary um it, it, it's when we when we uh conceptualize the idea of growth we we put ourselves on a linear uh thought process of you know continuously ever forward um but if we if we completely throw that idea out the window and we we think that uh we can stay where we're at we we kind of come full circle with it um and it's a sustainable circle where we are no longer uh rapidly expanding rapidly using resources but rather we are just perfectly uh fine with the amount of resources that we are using um so to kind of sum it all up i think like uh we definitely need to instill that idea that sometimes growth n no growth is okay um yeah Yeah, and, and we cannot discourage healthy populations. I mean, the uh, the G Green New Deal calls f calls for everyone to participate in more um, healthy living, basically. And um, so we we want people to be living good lives, and much of our populations and all around the world. Are not they're not growing they're not part of the the, the good life um, now we're we're pretty much done but if there's one more question out there someone wants to answer you've already asked a few Bob anyone else <laughs> sorry Bob anybody else uh, if there's no one else we gotta listen to Bob 
<laughs> okay. Oh, over here. Over, over here. here. Um, one of the difficult things that we need to think about is um, one of the reasons that the population is growing is because we are healthier and we live a lot longer. And um, you know, most of us in the room here are um, over 60, and we like living longer. We like staying healthy, and yet. You know, if we don't have younger people coming along to take care of us, and that's what they're worried about in China, what, what do we do? There's some very tricky kinds of ethical questions to deal with there. I don't have the answers to it, but I think we got to think about this stuff. Because most of us do like getting older. <laughs> so the comment is us older people do look for younger people to be there for us. Uh, we've benefited uh, by getting older, uh, by living good lives, rather. Uh, and I'm going to just let whoever here wants the last word, uh, maybe on this topic. <laughs> Someone, I'm just going to pass it to the mic. This is the last word. <laughs> I don't know if I can sum up this whole panel, but uh, to answer your question, um, about population growth. Um, first and foremost, I, I'd like to establish the fact that um, we are the first generation to experience uh, a decreased life expectancy and a decreased uh, welfare status um, because of climate change. Um, so it's not exactly the, the continuing trend, um, but uh, specifically, um, I, actually, I'm sorry, can you read it? Can you say your question again? That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Just repeat what you said. Oh, yeah. The question was, um, it has to do with population change, and specifically, um, if we if we decrease the uh, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, pretty much babies that we're bringing into this planet, it will uh, prohibit us from uh, making sure that our older generations stay alive. Um, I specifically don't know an answer to that. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's a good question. Um, but I just wanted to touch. Uh, I, I guess I just wanted to say that, like, um, as far as like, uh, th that's a good question, especially in the in the presence of the idea that we are ex we are seeing a decreased life expectancy. Um, perhaps that contributes to that, um, but I think that ties into climate change in regards to the fact that we are seeing a decreased life expectancy and a decreased uh, welfare uh, per individual across the world. Um, George, would you, Leah? Um, on my internship last year with the Alon Tal, the environmentalist, um, he spoke a lot about <laughs> he spoke a lot about um, how. When you can also decrease birth rates in other ways in the sense that like um, if you help women with um, reproductive care or birth control or all these different things that um, just these health cares or these necessities um, can also help in decreasing birth rate. Um, they might not be necessarily be the best thing or the most um, efficient thing, but that's definitely one aspect. Um, and also what Isabel was saying, I think she whispered it over the table when she said community, um, the idea if we decentralize and we make things more communal, the idea is the community takes care of each other and it might not necessarily fall on the hands of all, only younger people to take care of everyone, that everyone will be taking care of everyone. Um, I guess that's the dream and the ideal. I, I don't know if we'll ever reach there, but uh, uh, that, that's definitely what came to my mind. Yeah, and um, that goes back to the earlier statement on population issues, which is hopefully these population will be something we can manage over a longer term um, s whereas there are other things that we have to manage in a much shorter term and can ethically uh, manage in a much sh shorter term. So uh, there's no getting around the demographic imbalances that we have. We have to restore community to be able to work with them more easily. Sharing resources makes, makes right? Sharing intergenerational households, right? We, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So uh, uh, how can we deal with those issues in the short term while working to 
re reestablish some demographic balance in the long term because we're not going to go we're not going to get away from those contradictions and we can't ethically there's, and there's no way out so it's about dealing it's about working with it and in the long term fi uh, finding a better demographic balance there goes back to the main problem is overconsumption and overproduction on a systems level as well as an individual level and those things are interpenetrating um and that's something that we can address uh in in the short term Thank you very much for being here and giving us some insights insight into what, what we're, we're facing. facing. And we wish you well on the road. <laughs> and please uh, carry on. I mean, you've got a you got a fight ahead of you. And we're going to let Georgia say something. I mean, we just want to say thank you to you, you two, for planning this and having us here, and all of you guys in Sierra Club and in general. Yeah, yeah, that's so. <laughs> yeah, and thank and 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 just thank you for listening because sometimes it's hard to be a young person in today's world, um, and and be listened to, you know, and have an audience that is willing to do something about it with you. So that's cool, and thank you. Okay.